I'm Linda Wright. Um, I've been coming to Faith Bridge for, I've been a member for just over a year. In uh, 2016, our home flooded in the tax day flood. And six months later, I had to move my husband right away into a place because he was very sick and I couldn't care for him and repair the house. So moved him to a rental home where I could care for him. And then he passed away the end of 2016. So right after that, my mother also had dementia and was out of town. So I had to start traveling to Dallas back and forth to care for her. And after my husband passed away, I knew there was some changes I needed to make, included finding a new church. So I searched and visited seven different churches, but Faith Bridge is where I knew I belonged. I saw many ministries to help many facets throughout the body of Christ. And I just saw the heart behind each one of them. I started um, by joining the party on the patio and some friends that I that had gone to the church I'd been to before were also working at Party in the Patio. So I joined them and we all began um, serving and it was just an awesome time meeting new people and meeting the new groups there. But it was um, definitely a taxing time to walk away from a home of 44 years and then six months later lose my husband of 46 years. Because I had just moved into my home I just knew that after I moved in and settled down and, and sat down one night after I unpacked all the boxes, I'm like, what do I do now? I don't really know what I'm supposed to do. I'm like, a lot of losses in my life and I don't quite know how to, to deal with all this. And I, I felt like I'd handled each one at each time, but it was like, I think I need some help, but I don't quite know what to do. And I said, I'm going to sign up for Grief Share. Well, my thought was when I was driving to the church the first time, I thought, well, I'm not quite sure what this is about. And I hope this isn't just where everybody sits around and talks about death and dying and crying. And I was pleasantly surprised. It was an awesome experience. They are just so caring and so kind and so helpful and just we're right there to help at any time. So I gained strength in hearing their stories and we were all able to share. And as they share a lot of scripture through Greek share, was able to just verify and confirm to me what I already knew about scripture and what I knew about God and what I knew about his care for me and for others. It was my journey, but they joined my journey in helping me understand the journey I was going through and that God's not through with me yet. God has so many open doors at Faith Bridge. It's, it's just such a wonderful, loving community. Every leader and every person that I've met, you just can't help but grow. You just can't help but be encouraged and loved if you just take the time to step and join in the beginning, I felt a little overwhelmed by the size of the church. It was like, how can I ever get connected here? But boy, God knows how to do that. And the church knows how to offer so many things in so many places to help so many people. This is a new place in life for me, and I've got to know where God wants me to be so I can be the best servant for Him. I know He wastes nothing and I know that everything that he's brought me through, that I can now help other people get through. Isn't that a sweet story? Thank you, Linda, for sharing that. And it is true. We have a lot of different ways for you to step in and to get plugged in and to make friends and to be involved in. We're going to look at some of those uh, a little bit later. But first, I want you to take your Bible and we're going to continue the God is Calling series that we started last week. And <clears throat> if you need a Bible, why don't you wave at one of the ushers in either room? And uh, we're going to go to Acts chapter 7. Acts chapter 7. That's in the New Testament. And I'll explain to you why there in just a few minutes. So this... Uh, message today and our text today is going to remind us that God is calling 
all of us to certain things along the way. He has plans for all of our lives. And as Jeremiah 29 says, they're good plans. They're not plans to hurt us, hurt us or harm us. They're plans for good. To which we say, wonderful, tell me what's the plan for me? I wish I could tell you what God's plan for you is. And while I can't do that, I think what we're going to learn in our text today is that there are three big reasons that people get off track when it comes to God's will in their lives. Now, let's remember, when we left off last week, we had uh, introduced this new little baby, uh, Moses, in Exodus 2, and we'd begun his fascinating story, and we'd seen how miraculously, really, through God's providential hand, he was born under a national edict calling for the genocide of all the Hebrew or Jewish baby boys. And But his mother and father, they made every endeavor to see that their baby boy was spared. And by the mercy and the providence of God, he was spared. And roundaboutly, he would then become adopted um, by one of the Pharaoh's daughters. And so there, the very redeemer, the savior rather, the liberator of Israel that the Pharaoh surely wanted to get rid of was growing up unbeknownst to him in his palace. So we don't know, again, how long he stayed with his birth mother, maybe till kindergarten, first grade, maybe something like that. But at that point, the adoption took place and he moved into the palace of Egypt And he was given there every great privilege and all the finest education and all the wealth that you would expect growing up in royalty. And everybody had really high hopes for this boy, Moses. He's educated. He's growing up in influence. He's a highly placed child. And perhaps the Pharaoh's daughter who had adopted him, even dreamed maybe one day, my son, you'll sit on this throne and be our Pharaoh. Non-biblical history, that is not the Bible, but other sources tell us that Moses, by the age of 30, had grown in his military skills as a hero in Egypt, having led the Egyptians to a smashing victory over the Ethiopians. So he knew something even about war growing up in this palace. And so his star was really on the rise. The teachers and the coaches and the generals who trained him and the Pharaoh who paid for his education watched him grow up. The the entourage of the court and the playmates and their families and they all wondered what what is going to become of this life? What won't he accomplish? John Ortberg Ortberg writes, he was destiny's child. He was the golden boy of a golden country. Meanwhile, far away, in a little slave encampment, living in a hovel, were his birth mother and his birth father, who surely every day remembered the sacrifice that they had made to keep him alive. Every morning they would see that empty seat where he used to sit, and they'd look at that empty bed where he used to sleep, They'd see that empty place while they were eating and they'd know he's being raised in a magnificent court with the most powerful people on earth. But don't you know that they wondered from time to time, will he remember us? Will he remember what we told him about the one true God and who he is and whose he is? Will he think about his birth mother and father, who risked their lives for him. Well, today we're going to discover he never forgot that family. He never forgot his his real people. Uh, um, He never forgot his real identity as a Hebrew. Oh, sure, he loved the fast track, and who wouldn't love the fast track growing up around gold 
with all the royalty that was arranged for him. But we can extrapolate that many a night while he was lying in bed, he surely wondered, why is it that I'm living in the lap of luxury while my family and all my fellow Hebrew people are suffering the oppression of slavery? Why is that? Why am I here? What am I doing here? What's my purpose? God, what do you want me to do? If we weren't constrained from time, I would uh, take us into Exodus 2, and we'd read most of Exodus 2, where we left off last week, and all of Exodus 3, and Exodus 4. But I practiced and practiced in my study, and I realized I'm going to use up my time if I just read the text. And so in order that we get out of here on time, what I'm going to do is, is take you over to the New Testament where we get a Cliff Notes version of what we're talking about today. This is an Acts, and this comes from a famous speech that the early Christian Stephen was going to make, a sermon of sorts, before he would die a death of persecution. So let me read to you uh, what we're talking about, the abridged version that starts in Acts chapter 7. Uh, starting in verse 23. When Moses was 40 years old, he decided to visit his own people, the Israelites. He saw one of them being mistreated by an Egyptian, so he went to his defense and, av and avenged him, killing the Egyptian. And Moses thought that his own people would realize God was using him to rescue them, but they did not. The next day, Moses came upon two Israelites who were fighting, and they tried to reconcile, and he tried to reconcile them by saying, Men, you two are brothers. Why do you want to hurt each other? But the man who was mistreating the other pushed Moses aside and said, Who made you ruler and judge over us? Are you thinking of killing me as you killed the Egyptian yesterday? And when Moses heard this, he fled to Midian where he settled as a foreigner and had two sons. So at the age of 40, having grown up in that palace, realizing I can't keep living this life. This is not who I am. It's not who God ever created me to be. He finally went out to visit his people, the Hebrews, out there slaving it away. And he saw one of them being mistreated and he hauls off and he kills the Egyptian. So the question arises, why then? Why that day did finally, this is the day. Why that day did he finally go out to see his own people? We don't know. Maybe he just, did, finally something snapped and he said, I just can't stand it anymore. Maybe he just never could shake the voice of his mother whispering into his ears, those early years that he'd lived with his birth mother. Remember who you are and remember whose you are. You're one of the chosen people. You belong to God. You'll never be really one of them. Um, perhaps... His birth mother even whispered into his ear, it's a miracle that you're even alive, Moses. Who knows, but maybe one day you'll be the person who will liberate us. After all, it has been nearly 400 years, and God had said after 400 years, maybe you'll be that person, Moses. If so, Moses' instincts would not have been incorrect but his timing was a mess. And this is the first of three things that I wanna show us today as we're working through this uh, passage. So if you're taking notes, um, one of the biggest reasons people's lives fall out of sync with God's will, first reason, because to be in God's will, you've gotta do the right thing at the right time. You got to do the right thing at the right time. Moses had this inkling, maybe I'm supposed to be the liberator of the Israelites. I've, surely I've been groomed for this all my life. The problem is he never bothered to ask God. He never went to God and 
asked God, what's the timetable for this? I mean, is it now? Should I do something now? Instead, he just, one day, he just lunges in. He just plunges in on his own. And, you know, we can do the same thing, can't we? When we feel like something just isn't right and we got to make it right, and we just, we jump in. We just jump in to sort of fix it right. To, sort of jump start. Help God out a little bit, right? And sometimes other people end up strewn on the other, each side of the path, figuratively speaking, the way that this Egyptian man was literally lying there on the path buried in shallow sand by Moses. I think I've told you before how when I was in high school, I was enraptured uh, by the ministry of Billy Graham. Really, any preacher back in the 80s and going back further thought the world of him. Here was this man who was godly, who was humble, who was so effective. He'd go into the stadiums and he would preach about Jesus. And and then he'd look up at the end and he'd say, I want you to come down onto this football field if you want to trust Christ. And people would come, by the thousands, they would come. And he'd say, and if you came in buses, those buses will wait for you. You come down here now. Today is your day of salvation. And I remember I was so excited when I learned that he was going to come to Houston. I was in high school, and he was going to do a series of uh, s- s- revival services for a week at Rice Stadium. So I arranged to make sure that if my parents couldn't take me, I had a ride with somebody else so that I could get there and hear him every night. And <clears throat> though I couldn't have articulated it, I am certain that even back in high school at the age of 17, God was that week for the very first time in my life, sort of planting the kernel of what his calling in my life would be. As I sat up there and listened to him preach and watched people respond to Christ. And I think looking back, I I certainly, there was a kernel of God's calling, though that would not really be the experience that I refer to as my calling. That would come much more clearly five years later. But after the series of revival services was over a week later, I tell you, I went back to my church and I was a different person. I was so changed, I was so excited, I was so revved up for Jesus. And our church, you have to understand, I grew up in a little church. There's just several hundred of us. Nice people, good people. And our youth ministry, it wasn't like what you just heard about with hundreds of people. And we had like 12 or maybe 15. 20 was an exceptional night. And, and I got back to my church, and, and I looked at it, and I just felt this sense of, oh, this is terrible. I've been at the stadium watching God do big things, and look at this. You're pathetic, 12 people sitting here in this room in a circle singing kumbaya. This is, this is just unthinkable. We, we can do better than this. And see, we had a part-time, uh, uh, I guess she was kind of the, the, the youth pastor, a youth director, and, and they paid her a little stipend, and, and so she'd kind of do the thing for us. And, and Well, after Billy Graham... I just knew you need my help. And <laughs> so I, I, politely as I could, but not so politely, uh, moved in and said, you know what? I'm going to help you fix this pathetic ministry. <laughs> and so why don't you just sit aside over here and I'll run the show. She was like, okay, if you really want to. I got on the horn that night and I started calling everybody I knew. Everybody was on the roster. I was calling them. I said, next Sunday is going to be the most amazing Sunday night of youth group ever in your life. Will you come? Well, yeah, I guess so. Will you promise? Like, I'm holding you to it. You know, I'm not taking no as any, you know. And so people are like, yep. Well, I'm, I'm working through. And by, by Friday, I had cobbled together about 40 or 45 people who'd given me their commitment. I'm like, man, we are going to have a crowd for once at youth group. And then a terrifying thought struck my mind. What am I going to do to come good with this promise that I have made these people saying it's going to be the most exceptional night they've ever experienced? I don't know what I'm doing. I had never written a talk before. I'd never organized food for 40 or 50 people. And, and so I'm running around trying to put this whole thing together, but having this deep inner sense of, of, of suspicion or, or conviction, yeah, 
you're big hat, no cattle, buddy, and you know it. But, but I just kept telling myself, well, just, just do what Billy Graham does. It works for him, you know, and, and just, just talk a big game and talk about Jesus and tell him the bustles will wait. And people are like, we got some pintos in the car, parking lot. You know what you're talking about here? And, and so I, I, we get there and sure enough, they came. We had a big crowd. And I muddled through a subpar talk, probably the worst talk I ever gave. Pretty well preached the whole Bible in about eight minutes, and I had nothing else to say. <laughs> and so I said a prayer, and then we went down and played some basketball in the gym and ate some snacks, and, and the people left. Going home that night, I, I tried to convince myself that was the most amazing night we have ever had. But again, deep down in my soul, I was like, yeah, who are you kidding? By the time I got home, the thought occurred to me, oh, no. Next Sunday is just seven days away. What are you going to do then? See, the problem was, spiritually speaking, I wasn't ready to lead a ministry. I didn't know what I was doing. Was the passion that I had for Jesus right? Yeah, that was right. Was the desire to reach out to the highways and the byways and get people, why didn't you come and, and be up? Was that right? Sure, that was right too. The problem was I was trying, spiritually speaking, I was trying to put on shoes that were six sizes bigger than my spiritual feet. And meanwhile, that, that youth director, she was, she was nice. She was like, it's going great, you know? And <laughs> deep down, I'm like, this is a mess, you know? And after about a month or so, it had kind of, gone back to about normal and she said do you want me to take over again and I was like yeah what's the problem the timing was all off I hadn't had any training I hadn't gone through any of the process that one has to go. I think that's probably one of the reasons that I like that we have so many young staff and I like training and mentoring younger staff just so I can spare them the embarrassment of the things that I did uh, back then when I was first getting excited and, and just tasting the, 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 the possibilities of, of ministry. So the timing was bad. I'd never prayed about it once in hindsight. Not once. I wasn't searching for God's will. I was just going to make it happen right now. Um, but it was fruitless. Spiritual ends are never achieved by carnal or natural or fleshly means. You don't see miracles that way. Well, at age 40, Moses decides... I'm going to identify with my people. I'm coming out of this palace. I'm going to my people. I'm going to right these wrongs. I'm going to deliver these Hebrews. But you notice one thing he does not do. He doesn't ever think about God. You read it if you read it in, in Exodus chapter 2 particularly. He never consults with God. He's felt, hey, I'm surely good enough, I'm trained enough, I'm smart enough, I've won military, I can do this. It says in Exodus 2, 12, a really good verse, looking this way and that, and seeing no one, he killed the Egyptian and buried him in the sand. Think about that a minute. He looked this way and that way. But which way did he never look? Right. He never looked that way and said, God, is this what I'm supposed to do? Am I on the right time table here? There was no prayer. God's will is always going to be about doing the right thing at the right time. You'll never get it right if, you, if you're not on his timetable and you'll never know his timetable unless you're really seeking him in prayer and discernment and enjoying community just trying it out on them christian community biblical community getting their feedback not only was god's is god's will about doing the right thing at the right time that's the second thing 
It's about doing the right thing in the right way. It's about doing the right thing in the right way. What he did, that was not the right way. Never do we read, you're supposed to go and kill some Egyptian. Boy, that's a nice way to start your, your leadership journey, bud. Years ago, uh, when Faithbridge was still just a new church and we were still meeting at the Cleb Intermediate School, I remember there was a couple who came um, up to me and they said, uh, we've just been coming to Faith Bridge for you know, X number of weeks or so, and we just love it, and we're just so excited about what God's doing, and blah, blah, blah. I'm saying, well, good, wonderful. It's good to know what's your names, and it's good to know you, and blah, blah. And they said, and we just have a real passion for marriage ministry, and we just feel like God has brought us here to start a marriage ministry for you. I said, oh, wow, well, thank you. I, I, we need one, and, but, but I, you know, uh, let me give this some thought. They said, okay, that's fine. Several weeks later, they came back up and they said, you're ready for us to go? And I said, you know, wait a second. I, um, <laughs> I don't think maybe I made really clear that first time that we talked. We don't really know each other and I don't really have any history with you. And I've asked around, you know, people have been around our staff, you know, and nobody's really connected into you. And, and I, I can't just all of a sudden put you in a leadership role because you tell me God's brought you here to, to, to do this. And they said, but God has brought us here to do this. I said, okay, well, he's telling you that, but there's one person he hasn't told that yet. He hasn't told me. And that's gonna be a bit of a problem. We're at a bit of an impasse. And so I said, so, so you know, the way we kind of do it around here is, is we ask people to sort of get involved, roll up their sleeves, serve be humble, you know, and, and kind of come into the mix for maybe six months or so so we can get to know each other. And, and, and then maybe in time, we would move you into some sort of leadership role like that. Well, they rolled their eyes and turned on their heels and thought that was the dumbest thing, went off. About two or three nights later, I was driving with Suzanne and the phone rings. I answer the phone. It's this man. He's irate. I guess they'd been getting themselves worked up. And he's, he, now he's yelling at me. He says, Ken, I am calling to tell you God wants us to do a marriage ministry for you and you are jamming up God's will. And at this, I said, sir, you need to calm down. And I started to say another thought or two that could maybe be helpful but he batted that down and hung up the phone before he'd even hear the, the, heard, heard the rest of the sentence. After hanging up, Suzanne said, what was that about? I said, it's this man and his wife, and they feel like they're supposed to start a marriage ministry for us. And, and I don't think so, because though we might need a marriage ministry, that might very well be God's will. I am 100% sure that's not the way it's supposed to come about. Sadly, within several years, that couple had divorced, gone their own way, neither attend uh, here anymore. Um, was it a good idea that they had? Sure. Marriage ministry. What's wrong with that? Um, were they supposed to be the leaders of it? No. Right thing, wrong way. They needed to be in one, clearly. <laughs> they didn't need to lead one. And so when you do the right thing the wrong way, friends, you're never going to find yourself in step with God's spirit. You're never going to find yourself in the midst of his will. Now, I want to push us just a, a, a minute at this point, a little mass confession time, okay? I want to ask you, how many of you have ever, at least once in your life, you've tried to take on a project or you've sought to force a significant decision about time or money or a relationship or you've pushed a new venture You've, you've, you've pushed into something that would require some real wisdom, but you never really stop to ask God, is this really what you want? 
And is now when you really want it? Just to normalize things and make me certain I'm not the only one who's goofed this up. I want you to raise your hand. If you've ever messed that up, would you raise your hand? That's very comforting to me. Those of you who've never messed this up, I am standing in your awe right now, okay? How many of you who just raised your hand regretted that? Of course. It always leads uh, to regret. Um, So here it is. If God has planted inside your soul, inside my soul, inside our soul, a passion, sort of the seedling, the kernel of a vision, of a dream, of a ministry, of a thought, of something that he wants you to do, we got to let it germinate. we got to give it time to really sprout up inside of us. And we got to figure out what's the right way to go forward with this. And I guarantee you, it's not going to be a ramrod your way through the door. That never turns out well. I have a friend who says, yeah, that's fleshing it. He's fleshing it as opposed to being in step with the spirit. Don't flesh it. Humble yourself. If you only respond in your own strength, you'll have to, well, you'll have to be humbled by God. Either we can humble ourselves or he'll see fit to make sure that we are humbled. And that's exactly what happens to Moses. Realizing that word of his murderous threat had spread. And it spread fast, like in a day. In fact, Exodus tells us that the Pharaoh now knows and he's determined to kill Moses. At this, Moses fled. And that's what we always do when we're ashamed, isn't it? It started in the Garden of Eden. After sin, we always flee. We just want to hide from it. It's like, oh my gosh, how did I do that? It's what an embarrassment. He flees all the way to Midian. Where's Midian? The scholars tell us, well, that's a little hard to determine, but it's either in uh, Saudi Arabia or the Sinai Peninsula. So either way, he was going a good track from where he was there in Egypt. And he moves to Midian and some very good things happen to him in Midian. One thing, he gets invited over for supper his first night there and comes home with a wife. You know, that's a pretty good deal. And so he, he meets and marries his wife Zipporah there in Midian. And, and he marries into this great family. And he had a fantastic father-in-law, Jethro, or Ruel, who will teach him some really important leadership lessons that you'll read about in Exodus 18. Um, and he's going to become a shepherd like his father-in-law which he would have never imagined growing up in the lap of luxury. Shepherds were looked askance upon by the Egyptians. There's just nothing worse and lower than those who tend the sheep. But there he is now in Midian as a shepherd. And all in all, his life was, it turned out pretty well. And one year became two and became a decade and two decades and three decades four decades and finally at the age of 80 things got really interesting right at that stage of life when he was surely saying to himself you know I don't think my life turned out exactly like they thought it was going to turn out or even like I thought but I can't complain I got a great family I got children got plenty saved up for retirement and then one day God pays a visit to this much humbler Moses. And that leads to the third thing. If you hope to stay in step with the Spirit, if you want to stay in the center of of God's will, you're going to have to have the right thing being done at the right time, in the right way, with the right Spirit. The Spirit of humility. One preacher would write about Moses. The first 40 years of Moses' life, he just knew he was somebody. The second 40 years, he concluded, I must be a nobody. But the last 40, he's going to find out what God can do with somebody 
who thinks of himself. I'm a nobody. So let's continue on in Acts chapter 7. Uh, Starting in verse 30, after 40 years had passed, an angel appeared to Moses in the flames of a burning bush in the desert near Mount Sinai. And when he saw this, he was amazed at the sight, and he went over to get a closer look. And he heard the Lord say, I am the God of your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And Moses trembled with fear, and he did not dare to look. And then the Lord said to him, take off your sandals. For the place where you're standing is holy ground. I have indeed seen the oppression of my people in Egypt, and I have heard their groaning, and I have come down to set them free. Now come, Moses, I'm going to send you back to Egypt. And you know how we know that that Moses was a much gentler, kinder, humbler Moses? because of how he responds. When God speaks to him through the burning flames, then that fire that wasn't consuming, it says, you're gonna be my man to deliver my chosen people, your people, Moses, from slavery. He, in essence, says, you have got to be kidding. (laughs) Not me, not now. I mean, sure, I think probably in my young years, I thought maybe that was what I was going to do and that I was destined for some sort of greatness that way. But no, no, God, no, God, no. Look at me now, I'm old. And so much has happened. So much water has gone under the bridge. I'm an afterthought in Egypt. 40 years later nowadays, they wouldn't remember me. And those few who might remember me, they would only know me as that runaway murderer from 40 years prior. And Moses begins to push back in five different ways. He gives five excuses, which I'll summarize because they're so familiar to the excuses we tend to give when God is calling us to do something. He starts by saying, I'm I'm not that good. I'm a nobody, really. Secondly, he says, "I, I don't, know enough. I don't know you well enough, God. I I don't know how will I call on you and how will I know that you're going to be there and that you're going to hear me. And and thirdly, he says, in essence, they would think I'm crazy. They will think I'm out of my mind if I go back to tell them that. And fourth, I'm not a good speaker. Really, God, I'm in touch with my frailties now. I've, I've always stuttered I, I always had a problem. I'm not really that good speaking. I know how to fight, but I, I, I wasn't ever good at oratory. Besides, fifthly, somebody could do it better. So, there is somebody, send that person, God. There is surely somebody who could do it better, to which God says, Moses, I've known you every day of your life. I know exactly who you are. I know every special need you ever had. I'm aware of every strength and every deficiency that was ever yours. I know exactly what you did 40 years ago and why you fled to here. I know you, Moses, better than you know yourself, and I always have. But trust me, Your sin and your guilt, your limitations, your shortcoming, no longer are they the ultimate truth about who you are, Moses, because I am the God that your birth mother, Jacobed, always whispered about into your ear. I really am real, and I really am talking to you right now. And I'm ready now to use you. And you're ready to be used. And the reason I know it is because of everything that you just said. Look at you. You're a humble person. And I specialize in using humble people. Now, Moses... It's your time. We're going to go. Well, 
You do the right thing at the right time in the right way with the right spirit. Um, amazing things can happen. So I told you about my first foray into ministry. I was just pondering in my own journey just to come full circle because after that big swing and a miss, I went a more conventional route and began to submit myself to a series of summer internships in several very good churches. I would go to seminary for five plus years, work on two degrees, be in more internships from that, including the one I've told you about before that put me in MD Anderson for really one of the hardest summers of my whole life where I just about said, I can't do this. I just can't deal with the hurt, the suffering, the pain. I just, I want to go do something else other than ministry. And really questioned whether I was called. And then I'd go and work for a wonderful pastor in the woodlands those five years who kept putting weights on the bar and challenging me further. And you have to do a few funerals for a few parents who've lost a few kids. And you pretty well quickly learn it doesn't matter what kind of rabbit you try to pull out of a hat they're not going to be impressed all you got is Jesus 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 and there was a lot of I guess desert experiences to the end that 15 years later I was sitting in a room in Seoul Korea when I finally felt the touch of the Holy Spirit say, now I'm ready to call you to do a new work. But even there, I might have looked about the same as I did minus some hair 15 years earlier on the outside, but on the inside, I was a different person. Pastor Dan can attest. I can't number the times I called him and saying, I can't do this. What have I gotten myself into? It's too big. There's too much. I'm panicked. I'm gonna, this is going to do me in. And he would patiently, in his very Dan-like way, calmly reassure me and remind me, Ken, brother, God has always done his best work through people who are humble, who just try to stay in step with his spirit and dependent upon him. Keep going forward, Ken, he would say. Now, as I come to a close, I wonder where are you in all of this? Where are you in this story? I suspect some of you, maybe you've been trying to force something. It's too much, too soon, too fast. Maybe the word for you is you need to slow down. You're not going to be in God's will if you keep on going. Others of you, you may be trying to push that door, push, 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 and maybe God is saying, would you stop it? You're not trying to go about this the right way. I can't bless that. Or maybe he's put you a bit in the desert just so that you can kind of come to the end of yourself, become a humbler person. I wonder where you are um, today. My hope is that because you were here, you would commit yourself to saying, okay, God, I really want to be in step. I want to be that humble person in step with your timing and in step with the right method that you have. Maybe it's a relationship. Maybe it's a job thing or some sort of endeavor, financial or vocational. Or, or, or You've been trying, and maybe he's saying, let's pull back on that. But I do suppose that probably the majority of you, it's maybe not so much that you're pushing forward enough, but that you maybe are sidelining yourself. I think there's a lot of that. I see that in many a Christian. You're in touch with your frailties. You're in touch with your humanity. Somewhere along the way, after tempers flared and true colors were shown, you, you drew back and sort of put yourself on the bench and on the sideline. But the word that I believe God wants you to hear is it's time for you to move forward. 
The reality is all of us are a mess. All of us have sinned. All of us have fallen short of God's glory. And that's why we're gospel people. It's for all of us that he sent his son, his only son, to live the life we couldn't live and die the death we all deserve so that he could conquer the grave. We never hope of conquering so that we could learn to walk in step with his spirit, using the gifts, using the abilities that he's put into us. Just like the, the sweet video that we watched of Linda doing that in this new stage of her life. And so I want to close by just giving you a challenge um, right here. Maybe the, the, the challenge to you is to say, you know, it's time to take a step. To quit sitting in the back of the Midian desert. And so, so I told you we'd come back to this. We don't have much time, but I, I want to just hit it briefly. Pull this, this little menu out that, that you sat down on. Some of you did this last week, and if you did, I'll just ask you to be patient for about two minutes for the sake of those in whose lives God's working right now. Others of you, um, you say, you know, I, I would take a step. Well, how about a first step? If you look on the inside panel, you see this A, the panel A, first step. You could sign up just to take a, a starter step. Go to the Faith Bridge in Vajitas, or you could get signed up for a membership celebration or a baptism, um, you, or one of our classes, like the starting point class, just a good starter class. Why don't you take a step? Others of you, maybe you say, it's time for me to take a step and serve. I was inspired by the video that you showed. There's a lady who could easily have pulled herself out of the game, but she said, I'm not gonna pull myself out of the game. And she's serving. And there's any number of ways you can serve. And I'm gonna ask you, fill this out and, and put a little checkbox. And that way we can get in touch with you and follow up. This is your semester. Let's say, you know what? I'm going to do something. This semester, I'm going to take a step. I see the ushers have some, some pens if you need to, to, to fill it out. And then on the C panel, if you look inside, you'll see the C panel. And these are the grow groups. And there's all sorts of grow groups that meet in the neighborhood homes. You can find yours or you can find age-related or stage-related really is the better word. Um, ministries such as young adults or grief share um, why don't you check one of those and we can get in touch with you. And then there's a the last one. And that's local outreach. Any number of faith bridgers, you're like, I like going out in the community. I like serving people. I like helping people. The mentoring ministry at the schools, the Title I school sounds interesting or this or that. There's all sorts of these. I, 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 I don't have much time, but I want you to skim this. If you need more time, you can take it with you. Just bring it back next week because next week will be the last week that we'll be doing this. Um, others of you, you came back and you brought it and that was your homework and you did it. Good for you. So make sure you give it to a, uh, an usher on your way out because I really want to see us be a church full of people who are stepping uh, in accordance with the leadings, the promptings of his spirit, full of grace, full of truth, full of humility, right in step with his timing, right in step with the right methods and means for getting there. Let's pray together. Lord, my prayer today is for each person that as we go, you would help us to think on these things. Thank you for Moses and for how we can see so clearly the ways that he botched it up at the start. He certainly did. And God, all of us have botched it up. And for that, we say thank you that we have Jesus. Thank you for salvation. Thank you for forgiveness. Thank you for life that you offer to us. Thank you that you offer to come and live inside of us through the power of your Holy Spirit and dwelling our spirit, giving us new hope and new clarity and new life. Won't you come into our lives, Lord? And then as we go, Lord, won't you give us the grace? Some of us, we need to hold back a little bit. We're, we're pushing it. We're fleshing it. And we're going too fast or we're trying to ram our way through and that's not the right way. Others of us, maybe we've been sitting back and it's about now that you're stepping up and saying, it's time for you to step back into the game. I want you to be useful for my kingdom. Now is your time. Won't you help us to know the difference and to keep in step with you, Lord? We pray all of these things in the strong name of Jesus, our Lord. Amen. So you can give those to the ushers on your way out and we'll see you next Sunday. Have a great week. Go in peace.